Good morning, church. In Luke 15, Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep he finds? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. The lost sheep parable was told in response to the Pharisees' rebuke of Jesus for sharing his lessons with those the Pharisees considered undesirable. Jesus' response to them was basically that we need to help those who are lost. He goes on to tell the now famous prodigal son parable about the son who squanders his father's inheritance and comes back, being welcomed by his father with open arms. He doesn't end his tale there, though. He continues with the older, dutiful son's grumbling that he wasn't celebrated in such a way for all his years of dutiful service. His father responds that he was always with him, but right now is the time to celebrate the one who's been found. In a similar way, these days we are called to the service of our brothers and sisters whose lives need to be shown the due respect they deserve. We focus on their lives, not to ignore or scorn all lives that do matter as well, but to bring them equally into the fold to share the riches and joys we should all share. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. As we begin this weekly service to you, our Father, let us remember that your love extends to all your children. We know that you are the God of love, and that when any of your sheep are lost, you are there to find them. We understand our duty to support each other, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Father, help us to love all your sheep as we love you and stand by to support those who need us to find equality in the fold. Father, we know that you would want us all to be pure, and that when we praise even one of us, this praise lifts us all up to become better. Lord, give us the strength to love, respect, and find unity among ourselves. We praise you, Father, for the grace you bestow on us all. Let us help those who suffer at our hands, that we may find praise and glory. We ask you to help us understand the value in all humanity and find better ways to raise us up to find peace in you. We pray this in your holy name, and let us say, Amen. Amen. Number 296, and the title is, We Have Come Into His House. And from Psalm 122, verse 1, it says, Let us go into the house of the Lord. So let's sing, We Have Come Into His House. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. As I stand before you this morning, I'd like us to think about the word peace, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. In the dictionary definition, according to vocabulary.com, 
is peace is a stress-free state of security and lawless that comes when there is no fighting or war. Everything coexists in perfect harmony and freedom. And so as I stand before you, as I start, I'd like us to ponder the question, what is the difference between having peace with God and having the peace of God? Scripture speaks of having both peace with God and the peace of God. It is the latter that seems to be more directly connected with the third fruit of the Spirit. Although it is our peace with God that provides the basis and motivation for all special fruit, all spiritual fruit. In Romans 5 and 1 we read, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse refers to the results in our conscience of knowing that Christ has died for our sins and has been resurrected and taken to the glory as a sign of God's acceptance for his work of atonement for sin. The hymn writer J.G. Depp has expressed this truth so well, and he writes, And now we draw near to the throne of grace, and for his blood and the priests are there, and we joyfully seek God's holy face, with our censer of praise and prayer, the burning mountain, the mystic veil, with our terrors and guilt are gone. Our conscience has peace, can never fail. Tis the Lamb on high on the throne. We can, we can draw near by faith to the infinitely holy God without fear of rejection or judgment since Christ has borne the judgment for us. Thus, we have peace with God and not terror in his presence. The peace of God involves the first, the peace of God involves a further step having to do with our daily lives. In his closing address to his disciples, the Lord Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. John 14 and 27. What is the nature of this peace that Christ gives to us? It is the very peace that he possessed as he walked through this scene. We think of the time a storm came up while Jesus and his, and his disciples were in the ship. The disciples were terrified as the wind and the waves buffeted the ship. But where was Jesus? He was in the bottom of the ship asleep. He was at peace with all things because he knew that nothing happened without God his Father and allowing it. And he was perfectly subject to his Father's will. The Lord Jesus also experienced all sorts of sliding, opposition, reproach, and rejection by man. But none of these things ruffled him, troubled him, or led him to try to defend himself. Not that he did not feel reproach or rejection. No doubt he felt these things far more deeply than we ever could because of his perfect sinless nature. But he committed, but he committed all to God, trusted in him, and had perfect unclou unclouded rest in him. With the result that when he was vowed, he did not vow in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, 1 Peter 2 and 23. The Lord Jesus was at peace in the presence of all things that were so much against him. And this peace that characterized his life, he gives to us amazing grace. Note again in John 14 and 27. The result of this peace that he gives to us, let not your heart be tr troubled, neither let, your mind, neither let it be afraid. The Apostle Paul brings out a similar thought. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do we become angry, irritated, grieved, or sullen when things do not go our way? Do we fret, worry, when we find ourselves in adverse or uncertain circumstances? How often this is so with each of us. 
and we do not often excuse ourselves on such occasions by saying, we're only human. You would do the same thing if you were in my shoes. But when we respond this way, we forget that Christ offers us his peace, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, for which circumstances we should rather ask, what would Christ, would Christ respond this way if he was in our shoes? And the answer is obvious, we should humble ourselves. Another writer gives the following circumstances. Another writer gives the following comments in Philippians 4 and 7. Paul was in prison when he wrote to the Philippians, unable to build up the churches or to labor in the gospel. He might have been cast down in spirit, but he was never more so happy in his life. Why is this? Because instead of being anxious and troubled about the danger of the church and the afflictions of individuals, and about the souls that were perishing, he looked at them in connection with God instead of look, looking at them as connected to himself. Thus, the simple resource of spreading out all before God and casting it off himself into the bosom of his Father had for its effects that God's peace kept his heart and his mind, nor was it special to the apostle. He puts it before the saints as to which ought to be equally their portion. It is evident that there is no room left for anxiety. God would not have his children burdened or troubled about circumstances till the Lord come. This is the blessed source of relief. God is here working. And his peace keeps our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, where, he, where we give him his honor and our trust on one frequent reason for failing to realize the peace of God in our lives is the allowance of unjudged sin in our lives. Whenever we sin, that is when we do what we want to do rather than what God wants us to do. Or when we have the conscience of liking anything that God does not like, a barrier comes up between us and God the Father. It is not that we have lost our peace with God, our conscience has peace that can never fail. But just as with human relationships in which we tend to avoid one whom we've offended, we feel uncomfortable in God's presence as long as we have not judged our sin. And when a trial comes our way while we are in such a, are in such a condition, our unjudged, our unjudged sin prevents us from drawing near to the throne of grace and drawing upon the infinite reservoir of God's peace. The only solution is to humble ourselves and confess and judge the, thin, judge the sin in God's presence. Then commune with the Father is restored and his peace can once again flow unhindered to us and thus guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As we walk in the Spirit and are filled with the Spirit, we will manifest the fruit of the Spirit peace in all circumstances of our lives. And as we do this, and as we do so, we will find people wondering at us, curious as to how we can remain calm and at peace in adverse and trying circumstances. This is because the peace of God that we have and the peace that surpasses all understanding. And so the question is, what is the difference between having peace with God and the peace of God? Peace with God comes from being saved by the blood of Christ and justified by faith, Romans 5 and 1. And the peace of God is that very peace that Christ possesses as he walked through the scene, unruffled by opposition or danger, Philippians 4 and 6. So as we go out through the rest of this week, I pray that the peace of God be upon each and every one of us. The peace we experience from our faith in Jesus surpasses any temporary peace the world can give. It can ease your deepest fears and soothe your troubled hearts. God bless. Thank you. Our hymn before the closing prayer will be, It Is Well With My Soul. The number is 490 in our hymn books. 490. I will extend peace like a river. That's from Isaiah 66, 12. 
When peace like the river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall be sent. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is Before we close in prayer today, I want to remind everyone of the word congregation in that we are in difficult times today and we cannot gather. And though the word congregation literally means to gather together as a flock, um, we are blessed to have these wonderful tools to let us gather when we cannot be together as a physical flock. Let us close in prayer. Dear Lord, as we complete our service to you today, let us remember that even though we cannot be together as one physically, we are together in one as you are with us, and you're with us always. And we remember you, we pray to you as often as we can, we remember each other and we pray for each other and for the joy of being together as children of you. We hope as we go out during this week, we will do those things that you desire us to do, to spread your word, to help others, to make this world a better place so that when we come to your house in the end, we will feel we are more worthy of the love, the unconditional love that you give us. Let us go out this week and do as your children will do the best that we possibly can. It is in name we pray. Amen. Amen. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the
the way.